In the 18th century, Europe was undergoing a revolution. Without banners or barricades or bloodshed, it was called the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. The revolutionaries weren't violent. They were a handful of thinkers and doers, artisans, merchants, scientists, and in one case, all of those things in a single individual. When I was a boy growing up here in the Potteries, Josiah Wedgwood was regarded with awe as the first great artist industrialist. Wedgwood was a founding father of the Industrial Revolution with a relentless urge to change science, technology, transport, the welfare of mankind, and the retail experience of society ladies. And he did it all from a muddy village in the middle of nowhere. Achievements that might be better known if it wasn't for his magnificent ceramics. Josiah Wedgwood wasn't just a famous potter. He transformed Britain itself. I have a special relationship with Josiah. I had a privileged upbringing here in the Wedgwood factory. This was my childhood playground. In the 50s, my father, Norman Wilson, was production director. On Saturdays, he'd bring me to these works when he came to talk glazes and kiln technology. He was a potter. All my family were for some ten generations. But I had a different destiny. As a boy, I knew Josiah Wedgwood to be a hero, like Stanley Matthews or Yuri Gagarin. As a writer, I find him fascinating. Why do I want to write about Wedgwood? He combines so many different qualities in one human being. And he believed in beauty. He wanted to make beautiful objects and he wanted to leave the world a more beautiful place, which in my belief he did. An extraordinary inventor, of course. But he really had a complete new take on English society. And so that fascinates me. There's another reason. I was a witness to history when the company went through a post-war renaissance, but too young to appreciate it all. What linked my father and his colleagues to the great Potter? Did Wilson and Wedgwood have something in common? I'm going to navigate my way through Josiah Wedgwood's story via my own selection of five pivotal pots. I believe each will illustrate a turning point or theme keys to understanding a remarkable life lived in one of the most exciting periods of our history. The Georgian era is still all about us in art, literature and grand architecture. It's as relevant today as it was then made by people we feel familiar with. We think of the 18th century as all this. Elegant squares, proportion, periwigs, brocaded coats, the age of reason, Haydn playing in the background. And it was. But in the early 18th century, in a small provincial village like Burslem, where Josiah was born in 1730, things would have been as undeveloped as they had been in 1530. In the 18th century, the village of Burslem was not the metropolis it is today. Unlike today, this town and the five others that make up Stoke-on-Trent were a centre of industry, the pottery industry. The Wedgwoods had operated potworks here for four generations. Josiah was born in the family pottery beside St John's Church known as the Churchyard Works. His father, Thomas, would be buried there just nine years later. Joss was the youngest of eight surviving children. Their world was built on clay. The pots that came from Burslem were, understandably, a variety of rich, dark colours, or else a muddy cream made using lighter clay chipped in from Cornwall. For centuries, the British ate and drank from these very serviceable wares. But by the middle of the 18th century, a new kind of consumer was emerging, one who wanted something tasteful. Historian 
Jeremy Black. From the mid-18th century, you have the development of what they would have called at the time the middling orders. They didn't really use the term the middle class. Britain is becoming a much more prosperous country. People wish to display their taste. On the same time, of course, sugar is coming into the country, coffee is coming into the country, chocolate is coming into the country. So that the actual sociability is increasingly structured round, round drinking, stimulating uh, um, sort of beverages. So the man who's making nice tea sets and coffee sets is in business, basically. The man who's making nice coffee sets and tea sets, Josiah Wedge, is really in business. It is a active, urban, urbane life which requires a set of goods, a set of products to actually help you feel elegant. Josiah knew few members of the middle classes, but he'd worked for Pothers who sold to dealers in London, Liverpool and Birmingham, then known as Brummagem. With a gammy leg, and a restless, inquiring mind, Josiah Wedgwood felt ready in 1759 to set up on his own. To all lovers of art, this should be a place of pilgrimage. For it was here, when he was not yet 30, that Wedgwood moved into his beautiful ivy-clad cottage and started the so-called ivy works. Surrounding him on every bit of this hillside, there would have been smoking kilns of other potteries producing on the whole rather crude stuff, red and cream ware, coloured novelty ware. What was he to make? Well, Wedgwood was a businessman. He made what would sell. And what did sell, like hot cakes, was pottery that reminded the new urban money of the rustic idyll they'd left behind. The first pot in my voyage around Josiah Wedgwood represents the young businessman at 30 with a gift for making and marketing that set him apart. This pot is for serving tea, a fashionable drink, and it wasn't for the hovels of Stoke. It was destined for the tables of urban sophisticates who would be seduced by its lustrous green glaze. At the Wedgwood Museum, curator Gay Blake Roberts has just a few of his glaze experiments on file. Which would constantly ran trials, constantly worked on experiments, and these are just some of them. Wow. The very so he's trying out his bright greens. He's trying out his enamel colours. What uh, chemicals are going to go into these? The green comes from copper oxide. My father was a potter, always used to say, uh, in order to be a potter, you have to be a chemist as well. And Wedgwood, I suppose, is the supreme example of that, isn't he? Because he's a brilliant chemist. Yes, without any chemical training. It was totally picked up by trial and error. When you actually look at something like those, you suddenly realise how dedicated he was. the numbers of times he tried. Hundreds of experiments. Hundreds and hundreds. That's staggering, isn't it? These objects went on to actually form the nucleus of the pots that we now think of as Wedgwood. Josiah devoted himself so assiduously to glazes because as a potter, he had a major disadvantage. When he was 11, smallpox, left Josiah with a nasty tumour behind his right knee. The foot-operated wheel of the day was very uncomfortable to him. He gravitated towards other aspects of the business. Glazes, kiln technology, labour relations, and marketing. Things ripe for change. Questioning the way things were done in the pottery came naturally to a boy whose family dared to question the nature of God. They were Unitarians, dissident Christians. The Unitarianism is an important part of Josiah Wedgwood. He came here regularly and brought his family here when he was a married man with children. To be a Unitarian was to question the status quo. You weren't part of the establishment. Yes, you believed in God, but beyond that, you didn't subscribe to any orthodoxies. It meant that you passionately believed in free inquiry, in intellectual life, and he certainly believed in the education of both of boys and of girls. Underlying it also is this very, very strong sense of morality. He was, in many senses, a bit of a Puritan.
Historian Jenny Udlow has studied 18th century society in depth. Today we take religious freedom for granted. How different are we from the Georgians? England is far more tolerant than um, we might think. You could more or less believe what you liked. In fact, there is a range of dissenting beliefs which goes completely to sort of millenarianism and the second coming. A lot of the discrimination in Britain is actually not about the nature of belief. It's not theological. It's about class. Um, it's a, an idea that uh, the dissenting folk are people to do with business, with trade, or else they're the poor workers in the factories. If you uh, wish to be a respectable member of society, uh, you are an Anglican. It's a purely snob view, isn't it? It, it is. There was a lot of snobbery uh, connected with religion. Technically, there were enormous disadvantages. You couldn't go to the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. You couldn't hold an official position. You couldn't be a magistrate, for example, or a member of parliament. But this meant that um, the dissenters, many of whom were uh, men and women of considerable initiative and go-ahead, created their own culture. They were free, you know, to think their own way forward. As the 1760s began, in the Ivy work, Wedgwood, unlike some of his fellow pothers in Stoke, was thinking differently about the muddiness of the local cream-coloured earthenware. A small businessman with few employees, still throwing pots himself, a bachelor of simple tastes, he devoted every spare moment to experimentation. Pivotal pot number two. This isn't any creamware, this is Wedgwood creamware. The clarity of colour, the result of some 5,000 glaze tests. This pot represents the kind of ware that will make him a household name around the world. But at 30, all that was yet to come. Brian Dolan is a California professor with a passion for the genius of Burslem. The creamware that he produced was a much richer and much purer kind of uh, color and texture than anyone had seen before. Now, in addition to that, he made sure that the saucers and, and, and the tops of the saucers fit tightly, that everything was um, proportioned correctly, which originally made him stand out from the, from the others. Demand was high among the English for minimalist earthenwares that told the neighbours you had good taste. And then a new kind of client emerged who was even more needy. It's 1760. Wedgwood is the right man in the right place at the right time. This is a period when Britain is becoming the great merchant nation of the world and when exports are booming as never before. And a key part of that market is America. This was a time when Americans were settling down, they were building cities, and they wanted to have houses which were as comfortable, as well equipped, as well designed as houses in Bath, in Bristol, in Stoke-on-Trent. They wanted nice furniture, they wanted nice china, they wanted pottery, and there wasn't a single pottery manufacturer in the whole of the 13 colonies, so Wedgwood could see the market opportunity of a lifetime. Britain is the greatest trading nation in the world by the late 18th century. It has reconfigured its geography. I mean, Britain, in, if you look in the medieval period, of course, traded with Europe. But the opening up of the Atlantic world, which had initially benefited the Iberians, Spain and Portugal most, created a set of commercial relationships in which the British, in part because they have the freest system, the most liberal, or we would say capitalist, system of commercial organisation rather than a state-regulated one, they are really at the forefront of that. America would become Wedgwood's most important overseas market. As a Unitarian, he championed the settlers' right to self-rule, and he traded with the Cherokee to obtain fine clays. Josiah's creamware was in great demand, but he had to keep improving it. His quest was a glaze the colour of driven snow, something the competition hadn't even considered. Josiah had a feeling that through more experimentation, he could find that new something that would dazzle everybody. He wanted equal colors around, and he wanted the whole appearance of it to be a brilliant white. 
Every variation in glaze and clay was tested and fired in his kilns, recorded in a secret code. What he finally discovers after toiling for, for months in the, in the laboratory was just the right formula that he could bake at just the right temperature for just the right amount of time in order for him to get what he calls the good white glaze. The white glaze put Wedgwood on the map. As he began to become a household name, he spent more time in the capital, cajoling dealers and observing the habits of London society, what he called the virtuosi. He had an extraordinary affinity for the kind of things which would appeal to people. And he had a particular feeling, I think, for feminine taste and what women wanted to see on their dining tables. His good white glaze, his cream ware, had become something that every family in England wanted. And indeed, his very surname, Wedgwood, had become synonymous with the finest ceramics. The message of his glaze was purity. And Josiah guessed that the negative of it would be too. His black basalt ware was specifically intended to make the white hands of his lady customers look softer, more delicate. At Liverpool University, Robin Hill and Andrew Pop teach business history. They've examined the mechanics of what was the building of a Georgian super brand. His nephew mistakenly took some other factory's pots for some Wedgwood pots. And Wedgwood was aghast at this. And it was acknowledged amongst potters that Wedgwood made the best pots. And yet even someone as intimate as the business sometimes mistook Wedgwood for something else, or something else for Wedgwood. Wedgwood thought, I need to distinguish what I make. I need to say, this is a Wedgwood. Most branding now is literally a brand stamped on, for example, a piece of clothing. You can display the name, but of course with pottery, the name is always hidden. The name is always underneath, face down on the table. It was about distinguishing it from the outside, from the surface. And so we have this commitment to an ever whiter glaze, this, perf this perfectibility in the glaze. And then of course once you've got that in place you can really run with it and he developed something that we now think of as brand extension. You get a core and then you find new ways of rolling it out, finding new products, new outlets. In the first decades of the century the big house on Burslem's main thoroughfare was home to Josiah's cousins, Long John and Thomas. They were the famous Wedgwood potters then. In 1762, when he was 32 years old, Josiah Wedgwood stood here outside the big house on the pavement, looking in. He didn't know it, but he was about to become the greatest name in British pottery. Within four years, he would be the most celebrated designer in the world, the greatest arbiter of taste. And the catalyst for this was the two relationships he was about to form. Wedgwood was on his way to Liverpool on shipping business when he suffered a riding accident and was confined to bed there for a month. It was a hot spot for high rollers and deep thinkers. One of them was businessman Thomas Bentley. Josiah is this great manufacturer. Bentley was primarily a merchant, wasn't he? Bentley was actually in Liverpool working as an agent. He was actually very well versed in, in the ins and outs of the distribution side of the business to the new world, which of course was exactly what Josiah needed to, to, uh, to find in, 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 as a partner for his business. Josiah was the, the worker, he was the skilled craftsman, he worked with his hands very successfully, whereas Bentley, on the other hand, was the, uh, the one who worked with his head. In Bentley, Wedgwood had found someone who wasn't just a business associate, but a soulmate. Bentley was a much more sophisticated person than Wedgwood, he'd been on the grand tour, he came from a richer background. But something that Wedgwood responded to absolutely immediately in Bentley's character was this idea that if you've made a lot of money in business, you don't just sit on your hoard of gold, you go out and try and improve the human lot. Bentley had founded a public library, he'd started the Society of Arts, 
and he'd built something he called the Octagon Chapel, where he hoped to establish a rational religion. Through Bentley, Wedgwood now gained access to a new market, the gentry. The urbane businessman became the potter's man in the capital, and eventually Wedgwood's partner. The second pivotal relationship would provide him with the finance fully to realise his ambitions. Wedgwood had been in love with his cousin Sarah, known as Sally, for several years, but her father Richard had prevented their union. Now he saw that the good white glaze made Josiah a better bet. Wedgwood to Thomas Bentley, my dear sir, all matters are amicably settled betwixt my papa-elect and myself. I yesterday prevailed upon my dear girl to name the day, the blissful day, when she will reward my faithful services and take me to her arms, to her nuptial bed, to pleasure, which I am yet ignorant of. We are to be married on Wednesday next. Sally came with cash, which gave her the whip hand. How unusual was this? Clever parents, or clever women, very often, made sure that they had some money. There was always a, a system of a sort of contractual dealing and of protection, of putting money in trust. In the 19th century, you have women really surrendering everything they possessed to their husbands. Are you saying that in 18th century Burslem this wasn't the case? In the 18th century, they were very... Uh, hard-headed, sensible, practical, especially the, the Wedgwood family. And marriages between cousins is extremely common. It's part of keeping the money, the business, in the family. Over time comes friendship and interest and understanding. Wedgwood had the connections, the money, and a market-leading product to grow his brand. All he needed was a lucky break. In 1765, Wedgwood opened a letter from St. James's Palace inviting him to take part in a competition with all the potters of Staffordshire to provide a tea service for Queen Charlotte. Now, if Queen Charlotte bought his tea service, all the duchesses in England would want to buy one. And if all the duchesses of England bought a Wedgwood tea service, all the middle classes would want one too. It took Josiah months of experimentation to find a way of making 22 karat gold stick to his good white glaze. He mixed it with honey and fired it at a very high temperature. He won the competition, of course, but sadly, we can't enjoy its wonder today. The Queen's service has disappeared. It's it lost has it. disappeared. It's disappeared. Um, it's it's not somewhere in Buckingham Palace. No, everybody's been looking for it for years. When we try to imagine the now lost Queen's service, we're to think of a teapot like that. Very much of this shape, which mm. is very typical of that period with this wonderful crossed handle, but the Queen's service would be gold all over with these green flowers oh, standing out it on it. It would be gilded, it wouldn't be plain like that. No. It's but presumably washing it all the time is disastrous. Washing and using it, mm. it's taken the gilding off. Summoned to the palace, Josiah asked for permission to call his creamware Queensware, the ultimate in celebrity endorsement. The royal family acted as, as a sense, a stylistic example. George III, he has a wife who um, is, a, is a figure of London society and who is important and most people knew. He has a large family. Most people who are socially and politically active will have met one or other uh, royal prince. And of course, there are these new royal palaces going up. I mean, uh, there's the new work at Queen's House. We now call it Buckingham Palace. And these, pres these are centers of activity. You would expect, if you were a figure of society, to go there. And in fact, if you were reasonably well-dressed, you could go into the royal circle and meet the monarch with some ease in that period. Wedgwood was a household name in middle-class households. Queensware was an entree to the aristocracy. Once he'd sold to the royal family, Josiah Wedgwood was made. In the very month that it was known that the Queen of England was drinking her tea out of Queensware by Josiah Wedgwood, this hill in Burslem was crammed with coaches and carriages, and I think Wedgwood's rather grander relations in the big house behind me must have viewed that rather askance. 
because those carriages and coaches were filled with the nobility of England. Wedgwood wasted no time in alerting the press to his privileged status, even if his new title was of his own devising. He was now in middle age and in his pomp, but as usual, he couldn't rest. He was a celebrity designer, part of the fashion industry, defined by his favourite activity, constant change. My third ceramic landmark is copy of a pre-Roman vase. This is Wedgwood, the creator of art objects, successful manufacturer of useful wares branching out into the ornamental. Ever since the ruins of Pompeii were unearthed, all Europe had been gripped with a mania for anything neoclassical. Wedgwood saw this was about more than pots. It was about identity. We use the term neoclassical to describe British culture in the late 18th century, and of course it helps to provide an explanation about why Wedgwood is operating in the kind of stylistic language he is using. What it captures, and Wedgwood profited from this, is that the British have taken over the role of the ancient Romans. Real antiquities were in short supply, but Wedgwood's Etruscan wares were available in his own shop. He never relocated to the capital, but in the 1760s, Thomas Bentley began to manage a showroom somewhere here on Great Newport Street. Later, they opened in Greek Street, Soho, in Mayfair and in Bath. Most of the uh, places in London would have been a combination of uh, some presentation of the goods, some uh, stock which would be stored there, and then in the back would be an actual place where they would work on it. Pretty crowded space for these small uh, houses in London. Wedgwood decided that he should display his wares so that once inside it's all laid out in a manner in which that they might consider doing it at home. He made the actual selling space much bigger than that, an ordinary 18th century shop. Yeah, they could actually mill and around say, inside. My goodness me, I want to have... I want to have those plates, I want to have that soup to green. Yeah. What Josiah did was to say, no, what we really need to do here is create a space to stage the merchandise. These shops drew crowds that caused traffic jams. Wedgwood and Bentley pioneered the kind of retail experience we know today. Josiah wasn't just meeting the English grandees. The European nobility came to his sale rooms. This gave him rather a good idea. What he did was he packaged up boxes of Wedgwood ware. Inside he put an invoice and he sent them at random to several European great houses. If you like this stuff, keep it and buy it. If you don't, send it back. He was taking a colossal risk, almost certain to lose most of it, but it showed his immense business bravado. The package that went to Saxony and the modest home of Prince Leopold III of Anhalt Dessau, always known as France, succeeded in rekindling an interest first ignited on the Grand Tour. The prince was an acquaintance of the antiquary Sir William Hamilton, ambassador and purveyor of original pieces. Wedgwood's replicas were seen by the prince to be their equals, modern design neoclassics. It's actually hard to think of anywhere in the world where you get a better sense of why people went mad for Wedgwood in the 18th century. Because here you see it as it's meant to be displayed in a beautiful 18th century room, exactly as it was. And don't forget, this was a young man's house. It was a young man who had been to see all these beautiful things in Rome. So that what you have is this extraordinary vision of a German palace copying an English country house, and in the middle of it, this domesticated classicism, which was the essence of English taste. And Wedgwood, Wedgwood everywhere. Fantastic. The lucky keeper of the collection is Uwe Twilich. We must open the the window shutters. Oh! Oh, my goodness me. Yeah, the light come in, and we goodness. are in the age of enlightenment. This is so extraordinary. Very English, only we're in Germany. 
The prince was very inspired by British culture. I think the heart beat a little bit English. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at these vases. I mean, these are all Wedgwood vases which he sent yeah. over, presumably. Yes. Uh, they come uh, in the beginning of uh, 1770s in collection. This is fantastic. What do you think happened to the lid? Did one get broken on the journey? Yeah. He saw these vases which had been dug up in Herculaneum, yeah. Pompeii, yeah. Yeah. and thought, I could do that. Neoclassical copies yeah. for the aristocrats. They're just pure elegance, aren't they? Is it? In England, Wedgwood was himself preparing to move into grand accommodation, a new purpose-built live workspace. In 1769, the new building was ready for occupation. It was the most modern industrial space in the world. The works employed around 300 artisans. Processes were broken down to facilitate mass production. Staff became specialists in one area, but ignorant of others, so the chance of telling his secrets to competitors was reduced. Wedgwood demanded hard work, but his religious beliefs made him an enlightened employer. He built 76 workers' cottages near the factory. To combat the lung disease that killed potters, he considered a primitive form of air conditioning, this was Unitarianism in action. Most factories were hellish, and it wasn't much better out in the fields. The kind of romanticization that you saw in the opening of the Olympics was naive and ridiculous. It wasn't the case that rural work was in some way a benign set of, act of, of activities which were swept away by harsh industrialists. Rural work also was pretty awful, arduous and very long hours. He called the new place Etruria, after that part of Italy where the Etruscans had lived. In the 1920s, when King George V and Queen Mary visited the works, Queen Mary asked one of the workers, do you enjoy living in Stoke? And he replied, I don't live in Stoke, ma'am. We're all Etruscans here. On the day Wedgwood and Bentley opened the Etruria factory, June the 13th, 1769, Wedgwood himself threw six celebratory Etruscan vases. The one on the left was Josiah's own souvenir of the auspicious day. Josiah was about to turn 40. He'd made it, and he did still make it. It's an obvious thing to say, but Josiah Wedgwood was first and foremost a potter. Even when he was a young apprentice, he threw better bowls and vases than anybody else, than anybody else had ever done in England. He was a fantastically brilliant craftsman. And when he was working at Etruria as a distinguished old man, people would gather round and watch him throw a vase. It was a master class in how to be a potter. When he moved into Etruria as a grand old businessman, was he a, a suit? Was he afraid to get his hands dirty? No. Edmund de Waal is a studio potter driven to spend as much time as possible behind the wheel. He's not a mass producer like Wedgwood, but does he feel a kinship with him? My take on Josiah is that he couldn't have done that incredible catalytic invention of industrial pottery on that scale unless he absolutely knew in his fingertips what it was like to mix clay. What he seemed to be able to do mm. was to deliver artistic perfection on an industrial scale. This creamware is absolutely stellar. I mean, you've got this fantastic teapot. This is about Englishness as well. I mean, it really is. Imagine if we were picking up a bit of, of mice, you know, and there would be, you know, quite a lot of gilding. Oh, yes, and there would. would be, and, there, and, and you'd, you'd be being, being told very, very firmly, you know, how precious this was. And here you've got somewhere on, in, in a sort of Staffordshire River, but it's also a bit of the Orient, but it's also a bit classical. And it's completely perfect about, the, about English fantasy, about what, what, what the good life should be. And it's a blooming teapot. It's fantastic. It's beautifully fine, isn't it? It's but it's not too fine. No, uh, it's robust, yeah. but it, it's finely made. Yeah. And it's all the same consistency, and it's beautiful. When you feel it, you can feel the person throwing it in there, can't you? You can feel the, a, a finger and a thumb yes. in 1780 have held that. And it's all the thing about making that part of the kind of 
the joy of the object. And so here, you know, with this this fantastic cup and saucer, you've got this ridiculous handle here, which is too which too is glorious. I love glorious. this handle. I love this. That's a particularly wonderful cup. Yes, and you can actually see where the thumb yeah. has pressed these two and two bits. Of with handle a on. tiny handle like that, then it was nearly always the women who did the handles. Although he went for perfection, he wasn't going for inhuman uniformity or anything of that kind. No, it's industrial, but what does industry mean? It, it means real people working in one of those factories. So of course there's that sense of, of sort of um, a breath of difference between what everyone does. Thirteen years after the opening of Etruria, Josiah and Sally were gentry. They had money, influence, a great house and a large family. In the intervening decade, Thomas Bentley had died, leaving Wedgwood bereft, but still determined to make improvements in everything he saw and touched. At the age of 57, he was old by Georgian standards, but still felt he had work to do, championing the rights of man. Sending shipments to America required frequent trips to the port of Liverpool. Cotton, linen, wool, coal, and of course, earthenwares from Britain went out, and all manner of exotic goods from the Far East and the New West came in. Josiah was a merchant, but one with the belief that people mattered more than profit. The sight of slaves sickened him. His Unitarian convictions compelled him to act. The fourth of my Wedgwood landmarks isn't a pot. It's a ceramic masterstroke of marketing genius, designed to change attitudes by stealth. It's Wedgwood the tastemaker and moral crusader. Wedgwood wasn't just a man with a passion for making things and for selling things. He was also consumed with a passion for social justice. Am I not a man and a brother? The slave trade and slavery itself remains a powerful economic interest because obviously what you've got is very low cost controlled labor and that is producing goods like sugar in which there's therefore a high profit margin to the owners and the shippers. And that is significant for British industrialization. While Wedgwood would have irritated some people by his stance, there would have been other people that have thought, absolutely, this is the right approach to take. He actually made thousands of these much smaller medallions. That was wonderful, that one. Which he sent to people like Benjamin Franklin for free distribution to anybody who would support the cause. And you could argue that they're the very earliest campaigning Metal. Did he give them away free in England as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. It was the way he, in which he was able to demonstrate his support. Where would you have worn them? They were worn on watch chains, they were put into bracelets. Or pinned as a brooch, perhaps? Brooch. And it's recorded that some of them wore them as hat pins. Oh, wonderful. And it's said in a wonderful letter by Benjamin Franklin that they've done far more for the cause than many thousands of words could ever do because for the very first time, people are openly showing their support. The idea of using fashion to deliver a political message, predating the T-shirt by two centuries, was Wedgwood's. But it wasn't just the message that was revolutionary. The medallions and a new wave of pots, plates and wares were made of a completely new kind of pottery invented by Josiah Wedgwood. Josiah had long ago given up the idea of imitating Chinese porcelain. Instead, he thought that this new invention of his was even better. And in 1775, he announced to the world the existence of this new ceramic material, jasper. Jasper ware could absorb these very strong colors. And the most popular color of all was a certain shade of blue. Jasper was and is a fine-grained stoneware made from a mixture of clay and a sulphate form of the heavy metal barium. Wedgwood was so afraid of industrial espionage, he posted the formula to Bentley in two separate letters. For all his working life, Wedgwood was potter by day, inventor by night. In the pottery, he looked constantly for ways that the manufacturing might be improved. 
In an 18th century pottery, the best paid man was the kiln watcher. His job was to watch the oven and to judge by instinct whether the coal was hot enough and not too hot to fire the pots. Get it wrong and he'd destroy a whole oven full of pots. A very expensive business. Now Josiah Wedgwood came up with a solution. Very simple one, like so many of his brilliant ideas. Simple brass frame with a little lump of wet clay in it. When the clay contracted, it rolled down the channel and he knew that the oven was exactly the right temperature to fire his pots. He called it the pyrometer. Josiah's science was self-taught and his constant desire for invention self-motivated. In 1782, the simple lad who had left school at nine came here to address the Royal Society regarding his pyrometer and was elected to this, the world's first scientific institution. British society as a whole at that period was probably more engaged with science than British society is today. Many people who were not of aristocratic background, who took part in and were interested in the world of science, and Wedgwood with his utilitarian concerns, but also his philosophical interest in trying to work out how things happened, uh, was very much a man of science. Once a month, Wedgwood joined other freethinkers who dared to ask big questions. How common was it to have an intellectual society or a group or a club like this? It is a very sociable time and there are clubs for virtually everything, you know, from sort of glee singing to worm collecting. You probably find a club somewhere. At Soho House, the Birmingham home of a rival industrialist, Wedgwood and friends met at full moon. It was a sort of gents discussion group. It was a local affair, but then the locality was the Georgian equivalent of Silicon Valley. There's Matthew Bolton and James Watt of uh, the great Soho manufacturer and the steam engine fame. Uh, Joseph Priestley, not only a great leader of uh, radical dissent, but the discoverer of oxygen, or as he called it, phlogisticated air and photosynthesis. They each had a, a, a specialism. They could turn to the other person. They could turn to the mathematician if their calculations were not working out. There's the extraordinary development of new ideas and the, the collision of interests and imagination. It's an extraordinary uh, gathering. And of course, Jazar is one of the most extraordinary among them. It's so exciting to be in this room where so many geniuses met, where so many ideas were played off one against the other. And you get the sense of them all feeding off one another, really. Uh, you get, for example, Joseph Priestley pioneering our modern perception of H2O, the property of water itself. And it was Wedgwood who supplied his ceramic equipment to do those experiments. Then you get Matthew Bolton and Watt pioneering the steam engine on the strength of their knowledge of what H2O was. And who's the first person to buy a steam engine? Josiah Wedgwood. You have the Industrial Revolution literally steaming ahead from the ideas formed at this dining table. Dr Erasmus Darwin was a key player who became a close friend of the potter. An inventor, a poet, a physician, he suggested in 1768 that Wedgwood would be better off without the gammy leg. Josiah had already allowed the experimental inoculation of his children, possibly killing one of them. Medicine was science. 18th century medicine is the one thing one would really avoid at all costs. Josiah Wedgwood was not fortunate enough to be able to avoid it. No. The amputation of uh, Josiah Wedgwood's leg is, is a, a, a grim um, moment. Uh, he was fantastically brave. We can't say with hindsight whether it was, you know, what could have been done to, to help him. But it's very shocking. And yet it's part of his image, is stomping around with his wooden leg and using it to smash, you know, uh, inferior 
pottery. And indeed was his nickname, Old Wooden Leg. Old Wooden Leg. In terms of the medical advances of the time, Erasmus Darwin, awful liberal, doser out of uh, laudanum, opium, you know, if it doesn't work and you feel a bit woozy, take some more. And there are terrible notes in his book about, you know, poor Mrs. So-and-so <laughs> gave her <laughs> vomiting, uh, coma, death, you know. Um, so it is a rather frightening time. Mobility was an obsession with Wedgwood. The Lunar men will certainly have heard of his desire to drag the transport system into the 19th century. Wedgwood was a modern man, a key figure in the creation of what we call modern industry, but he knew that there was one vital ingredient missing, and that was transport. He lived in Burslem, one of the most inaccessible parts of England. It was on this sloping hill. It was full of rutted tracks, made worse by amateur clay diggers gouging out potholes from the few existent lanes. He wanted to devise a smooth, efficient method of transporting pottery from the pot banks to the dining table. He didn't just want to reform the lanes of Burslem, he wanted to reform the entire transport system of Britain. He wanted canals, and one in particular. Manchester, Birmingham and London had canals, but they were cut off from Stoke. That had to change. The most exciting project, really, of the age was the uh, building of the Trenton Mersey Canal. If the alternative was putting things on the back of mules and going over muddy roads, uh, or if you were lucky, putting things in wagons where the wagons got stuck in ruts, the canals cut through this and enable you to move bulk goods at low cost. And of course that's wonderful for ceramics, it's wonderful for coal, it's wonderful for many of the goods that are really important to British industrialisation. Wedgwood formed committees, raised funds and cajoled backers. When work began, it was he who cut the first sod. He'd spent 11 years trying to persuade his fellow potters that having the canal would be great for business. Though he was the only one who'd eventually of the Trenton Mersey Canal passing right outside his new loading bay. As he approached his sixties, Josiah could look down from his potworks to his canal and feel a sense of accomplishment. Little did he know, he still had his best work ahead of him. The last in our potted history is his copy of the finest example of an ancient vase ever found. The original was made in 25 BC and purchased by the Duchess of Portland in 1784. The Dukes of Portland were prodigiously rich. They made the rest of the British aristocracy seem like paupers, and the old Duchess of Portland placed it in her cabinet of curiosities. Then, presumably, it was the excitement which killed her. She died almost at once, and all her wonderful collection of loot, all her classical antiquities, were put up for sale in London. And her son, the Duke, was terrified. He, one of the richest men in Europe, that a manufacturer from North Staffordshire would be rich enough to outbid him at the auction. The Duke got the vase, but it was lent to Josiah so that he might copy it. All my landmark pots stand for a different facet of Wedgwood's personality. This one is tenacity, technical genius, and stubborn refusal to give in. It is deemed to be the most technically difficult thing he ever tried to do. Many of them went wrong in the kiln, they bubbled, they blistered, the ornamentation fell off. Why Before, was that? What was going wrong? The problem, I think, was the fact that he was trying to copy something that was effectively made of glass, cameo glass, in a ceramic body. And he was trying to make it the same sort of translucency. And it was with great triumph in October 1789 that he said, you know, I've got a perfect one out of the kiln. And what happened? Did he put it on display when he'd done it? It was on show in London by ticket only. Wonderful. There we are. Josiah in 1790 had more or less perfected 
his copy of the port and vase. And by then he was a sick man. He was taking a lot of laudanum for pains in his face and in his leg. He managed to get 20 or 30 or so, we don't know exactly how many, which were truly exquisite and were... Oh, I nearly dropped. No, don't worry. Um, this one is actually a Victorian copy, but um, he did make about 20 or 30 really perfect copies of the vase. And this was one I bought in a junk shop, probably cost me about 10 shillings. Because after he'd made the Portland vase, it became his hallmark and it was reproduced and reproduced and reproduced. The power to transform mud into china was a given for all potters. But Wedgwood went further, taking pottery from utility to luxury. Wedgwood could see that what he'd done was produce a product that was something much more than just utilitarian. This was art that you could eat off, drink from, serve your boiled potatoes from. But in owning a piece of Wedgwood ware, you'd become part of a larger movement a movement of classicism. You'd really become part of the Cognoscenti. Comparisons have been made with a modern design genius. What Steve Jobs did was to take an existing concept or an existing product and just make it much better. And I think that that could also be said of Josiah. Even when it comes to imitating thousands of years old pieces of pottery, he would actually take uh, good ideas, but work his magic and his aesthetic qualities and, and, and make that the recipe for success. Today, the six towns that comprise the potteries are home to call centers, fast food joints, and shopping precincts. As it has in much of the Midlands, the kind of industry that made Britain famous has largely relocated to somewhere far away where labor is cheap and the climate warmer. The manufactory on what is now Festival Way, once the most advanced in the world, is gone. Only the house that Josiah built remains. Etruria Hall, now a conference centre. One of the differences between us and the great Josiah is that everything he touched he left more beautiful. Everything we touch well, we don't have the knack, do we? This place is now absolutely hideous, and I think he would have been appalled at what we've done to his house. But if he sat here with the business execs, I think he'd have been realistic enough to realize trade has to go on. In the 1950s, the trade was going on. I grew up with the legacy of the first Josiah. My father and his colleagues wanted to recapture the spirit of the 18th century, they shared a belief in the power of design to make things better. That sitting on a sideboard, their pots could banish post-war gloom. They made their factory a well-oiled machine and, like Wedgwood, built ideal homes for the workforce. Those homes are still there, a five-minute walk from the factory. We lived just down the road. It's 50 years since I was last in the house I grew up in, smelling the cigarettes and hearing the laughter. And now this is absolutely, as I remember it, it's extraordinary. And this was my bedroom. I can remember kneeling on the bed and looking out of the window and I'm wishing I hadn't because I'd imagine witches and things <laughs> flying at me through the trees. It doesn't evoke uh, deep feelings, funnily enough. What I'm amazed by is the way that individual corners have created memories which I didn't know I had, the incidents I can remember. Thinking of my old father here, um, I can place him in various bits of the house, always surrounded with smoke, 60 a day man. Senior service untipped, of course. This is where my father would sit, drinking gin and French with old Josiah. My father talked about the Wedgwoods all the time. Him and Uncle Joss, as we called him, Josiah Wedgwood V, they'd built up the factory together. They'd been through some hair-raising times doing so, and they were constantly talking about that. I think Josiah I was a genius, and I think Norman Wilson was a man of prodigious talents and energy, but I don't think he was a genius. They had things in common, there's no question about it. Uh, Norman was inspired by the first Josiah to build a new Wedgwood factory in a rural setting. 
he was like Josiah in that he was both a businessman and a designer, and he had a passionately strong aesthetic sense and a horror of ugliness, and uh, really believed that popular tableware, cup saucers, uh, teapots, should be as beautiful as possible. I mean, he hated Jasper, for instance, and all that blue and white stuff. He just thought that was C-R-A-P for Americans. The side of America he liked was that optimistic belief in a, a golden future. And I think Josiah I had that. I think they were both sunny optimists, which I certainly am not myself. Much of the time, my father would be sitting in a chair, sketching out new designs. He used to get scrapbooks from Woolworths, and he did his drawing in fountain pen uh, on these grey pages. Rather beautiful, actually. As you can see, the pots he designed were pared down pieces for the decade when England swung like a pendulum, as did the company's fortunes. Josiah Wedgwood died worth the modern equivalent of half a billion pounds, but subsequent directors found the going tough. I was too young to appreciate the glory days. A few years later, I knew all about the demise of the potteries. The whole pottery industry had changed completely, and that certainly wasn't agreeable to my father. He just warned us, me and my brother, off. He just said, don't have anything to do with it. I think he was quite right, too, probably. I actually got into an art school, and he was very angry and made me withdraw. And I was feeble enough. You should never obey your parents over things like that. I mean, you should obey your parents when you're little and eat up your rice pudding. But when you're older, you should follow your star. And I was a coward about that. If I count back through my family, I think my father was probably something like a tenth generation potter. And I think I probably thought when I was a little boy, there was an inevitability about my doing the same. But uh, destiny had a different idea. I'm fairly an amateurish at it, as you probably see. I fancied the life of the potter but the first Josiah's sons didn't. Josiah had educated his sons and he'd given them money, a lot of money, and they'd become more or less landed gentry. This was a bit of a trouble in a way because although they went into the business, they weren't really inclined for it and they thought themselves a little bit too grand to be in trade. Nevertheless, there was genius in that DNA. And when Suki, Wedgwood's favourite daughter, married Robert Darwin, the son of Dr. Erasmus Darwin. What a gene pool that was. In 1809, they had a son. He inherited a great deal of the inquiring mind and spirit of Josiah Wedgwood. He also inherited a lot of money, which gave him leisure for his researches. And the name of that genius was Charles Darwin. The Age of Enlightenment brought huge changes to the world, and Josiah was personally behind quite a lot of them. But I think the change that meant most to him was that the humble craft of the potter was now perceived to be a fine art. When they carved his epitaph, they said he converted a rude and inconsiderable manufactory into an elegant art.